It was a love of words. That was one thing. I was a very strong English student, did English honours degree at university as well. And I use words every day, constructing them in drafting or using them in argument. It was also a love of arguing and developing an argument. And I don't mean, you know, being objectionable there, but I did a huge amount of debating and public speaking at school. And that was very strong influence, I know, in deciding to become a lawyer. What was it like going from a partnership of 36 to one of just 12? Going from a lar what I'd consider a large partnership of 36 to, to one of 12 is hugely different. Um, I think one of the big issues that law firms have is they're getting so much bigger and partners, this business model we have of partnership, Partners actually want to be involved in the business. They, they invest in it, they own it, um, and they want to be involved in the decisions of that business. And when you get too big, you just can't be. It's no longer possible to run an efficient business and have everyone involved. So your average partner becomes quite disenfranchised with that model. And I know here with 12 partners, or 13 now, since we've just added Steve Mackay to our partnership, um, you're very much an owner-operator. Doesn't mean we don't have a management committee that makes day-to-day -day decisions, because we do. That helps with efficiency. But the partners are very involved in the decision-making and it engages them. You've said the arrival of global law firms in Australia is one of the biggest things to happen to the legal profession in a very long time. Why is it so significant, do you think? I think the arrival of international law firms into this market is, is a, a really huge change. I think it's been assisted by the fact that the Australian dollar is so high, so you know it's, it's a viable business proposition for international law firms and because our market, even though people might complain that it's not performing, in an international sense it is, it is the economy is in a much better state than many countries overseas. But what it's doing to the local market here is, well, there's, there's one issue, which is a sort of a copycat issue. So many people are looking at, well, that firm's done it, so therefore I need to do it. So they're, they're following the lead of someone else without thinking about, is this strategically the right thing? I, in my view, is this strategically the right thing for our business is are our clients saying they need it because we haven't suddenly had a whole lot of clients clamouring around saying in the year 2012 we need international mergers you must provide that to us I don't think any of those firms would say that um, certainly none of our clients are saying that they're just not it, it, it's just not rating with them but um, it it is shaking up the legal industry and I think it is disenfranchising partners. We've never seen such partner movement as we've seen over the last year, and I think it'll continue. Um, because there are partners who are saying, actually, I don't want that. It's costing me money to be involved in that sort of thing. I don't think I can see the benefit. I might not see that strategically my client base fits anymore. Um, it is tough on an existing client base to say, actually, we're looking over here we're looking to China or we're looking to Asia or we're looking overseas rather than respecting our relationship with you and saying you're the most important thing. There are firms that are not going to survive this because they're not, um, they're smaller possibly and they're going to be gobbled up. There are a lot of lawyers in our system now um, and competing pretty vigorously for a client base here. And so I think there will be firms who aren't prepared to think about that and innovate and, and think about what the client wants and, and present that to the client and even be proactive about that to, to our clients. But um, so it's a huge period of change mm -hmm. and having quite a significant effect coupled with an economy that, you know, is, is challenging mm -hmm. for those firms who are very heavily geared. Um, and what do you do when you're not actually working? When I'm not actually working, right, I, I have a work hard, play hard attitude to life. Um, so yeah, I play quite hard. Um, I've got Greek blood and my mother's Greek and Greek 
people are very culturally into food and family and friends. So we do a lot of entertaining. I do a lot of cooking. Thoroughly enjoy it, but you know, I, I really do like the big family and friend lunch that just extends into the afternoon and have some good laughs and good food. Um, I do a lot of reading. Um, that's, that's been something I had to give up when I had young children and it, it killed me. You know, not having the time just to read for fun um, was quite a big sacrifice, but I just didn't have the time. So now, as my children are a bit older, um, I go to a book club, but I'm very strict. I say to my book club friends, you know, I'm only prepared to th read things that are really good. Can't read rubbish, don't have time for rubbish. Um, so they really, they're very good. They humour me and they say, well, this is excellent. This is only average. And What's been one of the most rewarding or memorable experiences of your career? 16 years ago when I had my first child, I was on the board of one of my clients, publicly listed company, and um, it, it was a subsidiary of this publicly listed company. And I was, I was there for a period of, of set up and they had a board meeting during my maternity leave period. And these were quite significant, you know, they were three or four hour meetings. I was breastfeeding at the time. I had been inseparable from my child. I think he, he was about three months old. And I thought, well, I'm taking him to this board meeting. So I took him to the board meeting and he was absolutely sat next to me in the board meeting or he, he slept next to me, blissfully great sleeper, this little one slept right through till about an hour before the end. Of course, he needed a feed. It was a long time um, to go without a feed. And the chairman, who was about 60 at the time, um, really lovely gentleman, very conservative, looked at me, realised I was going to breastfeed through the board meeting. I was not going to leave that meeting. I needed to be there to hear what was going on. I knew the feed was going to take at least 20 minutes. Um, he didn't skip a beat, he kept going through and we just finished the entire, I finished the feed, my child went back to sleep, we finished the agenda, but at his retirement speech he said this was one of his memorable experiences, the first board meeting in his life and he had been to many where someone had breastfed through the meeting, but full marks to him that at the time it was not an issue. And that was 16 years ago. I can't believe we're having this debate now. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, I take it you weren't very impressed with what she's comment. No! I mean, really. It's not really his business. It's not. It's the year 2013. I mean, I just can't believe there's a debate happening about this. Mm. Anyway, I thought we'd moved on. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> memorable. <laughs> You come across as a very energetic leader. What do you do to keep that passion and motivation? If you're not passionate about what you do during the day and spend a huge amount of time doing, you really need to change what you're doing. It's just too much time. Life's too short for average um, or, or sort of only half engaged. And, you know, I've been very lucky to have felt very passionate about this job and still after over 20 years still find the intellectual challenge of law is still really strongly with me. So I really love being a lawyer. Um, I love solving the puzzles that clients give me. I love finding the solutions. I love having the relationships with them and you know seeing how their businesses change and seeing how I help um, grow their businesses. In terms of how, you know, what are the good qualities of a leader? I've seen a lot of leaders in my time as a lawyer, um, both in the firms I've been in and in other firms. And I think the thing that distinguishes um, a really exceptional leader from an average leader is vision for me. Um, vision is a very hard thing to acquire, I'm not sure you can be trained to acquire vision. I've seen a lot of um, leaders who are, if you like, caretakers going through the motions. It's very hard in a law firm, particularly one where you're, you've got a practice you're managing and you've got a management role. Um, so I appreciate that because I'm doing that right now. 
Um, but I think there can be a little too much caretaking without the vision.